Hey everyone, this is Randy Malden with Supply Leaders Academy and here with Captain Howard Knapp. And we're going to be talking about supply chain resilience, leadership, leadership in supply chain resilience, because as you'll see, it's not the normal leadership that most people talk about. It's something different and unique because collaboration is key when you're talking about resilience. And we're going to get to that a little bit today. So Howard, why don't you go ahead and uh, say hello and let people know who you are and what you do. Hey everyone, Captain Howard Knapp here, as Dr. Randy was saying. Started off my career as a graduate of Auburn University. My major was supply chain management. That's where I started my career. From there, I started my aerospace career in a company called Ontic, which manufactures military and civilian aircraft components. I was there for six years. I had, about, I had three jobs. One was production control supervisor, I was on the production floor as production supervisor in charge of 11 technicians. And I ended my career at Ontic as a buyer too uh, in the government business unit. So I did all the ordering for military contracts. On the military side, I uh, started my career as a commission in 2008 as a second lieutenant in the Alabama National Guard. Eventually I became a quartermaster officer, worked my way up to captain, where I became classified as a logistics officer. Major jobs I had was battalion logistics officer. I was a company commander for a composite truck company. And then I was also the brigade logistics officer. So a lot of experience in logistics and supply chain. And the right kind of experience that we're gonna talk about today, which is That's leadership fair. and building resilient supply chains. Because looking at Howard's background and my background as well, over 20 years in the Marine Corps in building these supply chains and actually operating them during operations where resiliency count and lives matter when you when your, your supply chain runs, to make sure it works and getting people to do things and leading people to get things done that they may not necessarily want to do. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's go ahead and just take care of a few things as we get started. One, if you want to get the mind map, we're going to use several mind maps this evening. If you want to get a copy of that mind map, just go to this link, cpsmtraining.com, mind maps for procurement, download the free guide, then send me an email with your connection and we can hook you up and make sure you get access to these mind maps. Also, if you send me an email at randy at cpsmtraining.com, I will send you a free book, Supply Chain Management by the United States Marine Corps. This was my doctorate dissertation. And a big point about this book that we learned is that leadership was key. Getting people to operate and actually execute in an austere environment. When everything else was falling apart, people were the key and leadership is what made it happen. Now, I just want to share with you tonight that Howard recently published a short EPUB ebook that you can get if you visit hnap.com forward slash resilient dash book ebook resilience dash ebook if you go there you can download a copy of this book and have that to actually go with everything we've been talking about over the last few weeks when we're resilient supply chain management supply chain management supply chain resilience and then of course get involved with our upcoming supply chain resilience program if you want to be on the early notification list because once we launch this, it's going to be limited access to people that join first and get into it because we're going to be doing a lot of things. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. As we're putting together the program, we're going to have training that's going to teach you what to do. We're going to give you time and coach you on building your own program. And then the real fun part, which I'm looking forward to, are our tabletop exercises where you're going to exercise your plan to see how it actually works during a crisis or during a situation. Because as you'll see with Howard's presentation a little bit later, Exercising and rehearsing your plan is essential to actually making sure this works. It's easy to burn brain cells and electrons and talk about things, but when you actually start to execute, that's when you start to see the problems and see where your plan might fail. And you'd rather do that in a rehearsal than in the actual deal. So we're going to kick it off with leadership for supply chain resilience. As I mentioned before, my background was 20 years in the Marine Corps, where I served in various positions, started out enlisted, working my way up through the ranks, serving as an Amtrak officer, where I did a lot of logistics, heavy mech in amphibious operations, then serving as a logistics officer, supply officer in various operations, uh, deployed in the uh, Middle East, deployed in Africa, doing different supply chains there as well, but building supply chains so that they operated when they matter. Now, as you notice here, my photography is, I look much younger and much thinner at that time, but I had an opportunity to meet uh, General Colin Powell, as well as you see, my brother was also in the Marine Corps. We were together at the Marine Corps Ball in Okinawa. Now this is uh, Howard's 
Captain Howard Knapp and his experience. So, Howard, why don't you share with us what we see here on these pictures? Well, here's a, a few key cool ones that I'm really proud of. Uh, so, on the top right, you can see was when I commissioned. Oh, uh, well, that's a little bit, but actually, you know, it's sort of scratch it out. As you can see on the top right, that is a picture when I first started my career at my school that I went to, Marion Military Institute, what was my source of commission. Uh, in that picture, I was 17 years old, going to basically our the officer's version of basic training. Uh, and it's me and my best friend on the left. As you can see in the middle, there he is again with me uh, after that was at, during my um, change of command ceremony when I did three and a half years as a company commander. I was one of our vehicles in the back called an MRAP. Uh, you can see what they're me on the left doing pew pew stuff, shooting some pistols. Uh, as an officer, we don't get the cool rifles. We have to shoot our little pistols because they're out there on our computers more than anything else. <laughs> so those are some of the pictures right there. Nice. As you see, we have the experience to talk about supply chain resilience and give you the right advice. So when you set this up for your organization, you can operate in a crisis scenario. And the crisis today that we're talking about is adapting and overcoming. You know, it, a lot of us are experiencing the COVID-19 situation and how it's affecting your business. Even today, they're starting to talk about the food supply chain. And my thoughts on this is that supply chain is the new battleground in that it's not so much about bullets and band-aids and shooting people and hurting people. It's going to be about controlling the economic ties, which has always been about, but now it's actually more prevalent. So if you're not looking at your supply chain and figuring out how do I secure it, how do I make it resilient to survive any situation, you need to shift your thinking. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight is the leadership side of it, as well as how do you operate during a crisis so that you can maintain a solid supply chain so that your team always has the resources that they need. Just to review on things that we've talked about up to this point, we talked about the phases of planning a resilient supply chain. We had five phases. If you're interested in looking at that webinar, just click somewhere on the screen here. You'll see a link to that webinar and you can watch it and get the five phases of resilient supply chain planning. So you can build a resilient supply chain as well as our rapid supply chain response planning. This is what you do once you get into the crisis every day or there's a new urgent need. You're going to operate using this rapid supply chain method so that you can quickly adapt faster than your competition or faster than the situation so that you can get those resources before someone else. And I know Captain Howard's going to share with us some experiences that he had where he was fast and on target before someone else so that he was able to secure resources when somebody else wasn't able to. Here's a mind map of the entire thing that we're talking about tonight. So again, if you want a copy of this mind map, just go to that link I mentioned before so that we can get you that copy so you can actually see how this is going to work for you. And we're going to kick it off with the leadership side. And when I talk about the leadership side, we're talking about leadership side. And then we're going to talk about the EOC, Emergency Operations Center, for your resilient supply chain. And as I mentioned before, we're going to talk about supply chain resilience leadership right off the bat. My part of this presentation is more to talk about the theory and the actual execution of leadership. And then Howard's going to talk about how do you organize an emergency operations center? More importantly, how do you run one? So the things I'm talking about now with the leadership side are key to actually executing an emergency operations center that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Now, we talk about supply chain leadership. We want to begin with what is the definition of supply chain resilience leadership? Why is it different? And I got the picture up here where we have the drill instructor from way back when, you know, which is very direct and very authoritarian versus someone who is more of a team player and a collaborator. And when you do supply chain leadership, resilience leadership, you're kind of between the two. You want to start with collaboration, understanding needs, which we'll talk about here in a few slides. But when the situation needs you to be authoritarian and direct people what to do in a very direct way, then you need to have that ability as well. So you're balancing between the two as you're operating a resilient supply chain. And the characteristics of the leadership style is very collaborative. You're talking to people, you're asking questions, you're trying to understand their needs so that you can meet those needs. And you're, you're, one way to envision them, it's not that in the upper corner there, we have people yelling at each other, just trying to get things done. Instead, it's more of a consultative, consultative leadership style where you're talking with people, getting to understand things so that you can provide those resources that they're looking for. 
And ultimately the value of modeling supply leaders is that you don't have a team at the top where you're all beat up every day. They're still happy to work for you. Instead, you want a team that's not so beat up, but is still happy and motivated to work every day. Try to avoid that and getting them beat up. That's why we want to model those supply leaders. And how we do this, what's the impact to your business is that when you have a supply leader, they actually start to transform your organization because what happens is people start to ask, well, do I have the resources to execute this specific plan? They start to include supply chain during the planning process instead of after the planning process where they hope it might work. Instead, you've got those supply leaders with you right up front, right in the beginning to tell you what resources you have available to you versus those resources that you may not have available that you assume are there and then aren't there when you them. Instead, you make the right plan with the resources that you actually have available for you so that you're able to be successful. And those results are good supply chains, resourced plans that are actually executable because you have the right things in place, the right things at the right place, the right time, the right quantity and the right quality which we talked about in our other webinars, and we explain that in a little bit more detail. So again, if you want to check out those webinars, just click on the page here, find those webinars, and you'll be able to move forward and learn more about that five hours of the resilient supply chain planning. Now, when you're building leadership for supply chain resilience, you really need to understand all the different stakeholders you have involved in your supply chain. And here's another graphic we kind of put together to kind of illustrate how they all work together. One is the organization chart you have in the middle where you have the CEO. You may be familiar with this type of structure where it's a hierarchical structure from the top down. But what we want to also note here is that you have investors as well as the community and your vendors. All of these folks are stakeholders in your resilient supply chain. Your investors, of course, want you to make money, be profitable as a company, and your local community is counting on you. Your customers are counting on you to provide the service that you're looking for or that they're looking for and that you're going to provide as that business. And the one down at the bottom, the vendors are often overlooked because there's an assumption that the vendors will always be available. And as you can see now in the current situation, some vendors may not be there. They're not open. Their people are not well, so they're not they don't have the resources to actually execute their production or to provide the service that you've been looking for. So they are a stakeholder in this, too. And as you're building the plans that we'll talk about in our supply chain resilience program, vendors and understanding your vendors and what they do is critical to understanding how well you'll be able to survive a crisis when it actually happens. When we do leadership, the leadership style I like to talk about is what we call the DISC method. And that is focused on behavior styles. And we have DISC, D-I-S-C, dominant, influenced, steadiness, and conscientious. And when we look at the styles, the different styles that are out there, what it tells us is that we need to adapt our leadership style, our communication based on the person that we're actually speaking with. The dominant person is more task oriented, more direct in their nature. The influential person is more social, needs to really understand the situation. The steady person wants to make sure everyone is taken care of. And the conscientious person is data driven to make decisions if they're even willing to make a decision. Now, if you're interested in trying to figure out what kind of disc style you have, just click a link here where you're going to be able to actually go in purchase the opportunity to do an assessment so you can find out exactly where you fall in this spectrum. And we actually have some training that goes with those assessments. So you actually understand when you receive your assessment, how you need to start to adapt how people see you and what you do when you communicate, as well as when you communicate with others, you want to make sure you communicate in a way that they need you to communicate. And when we have that disc leadership style, we're able to get that supply chain resilience buy-in. One of the big questions we've had when we've been building these presentations over the last few weeks is how do I get people to buy in to this particular thing called supply chain resilience? Well, it starts way before you actually need it to happen. And what it starts with is you buying in and teaching and giving people that trust and credibility to get things done. And then we follow this process, as you can see here, explore the needs, collaborate, understand the needs, confirm the needs, and then assure everyone is getting the value that they expect. And building rapport and understanding behavior styles goes directly to building 
the buy-in you need to have a resilient supply chain. Now, how do you get buy-in? Well, it begins with understanding and exploring those needs. If we go back to the DISC model that we talked about here, what it is, you need to understand what are their information needs that you need to give them. A dominant person needs the tasks that need to get done, very short and to the point. The influential person needs to understand not only the task, but why it's important to get those tasks done. The steady person needs to understand how the task is going to work in the bigger picture. And the conscientious person needs to understand the data required to get that task done. In other words, what, what information do I need to actually accomplish that task? So when we talk about building out and understanding those needs, we're asking questions. What do you need? And based on their answers, you're observing how they answer so that you can adjust the information you're going to provide to them based on what they need. Why is that important? The reason that's important is because the direct person needs it short and sweet and to the point so they can make a decision and move on. The conscientious person needs data to make a decision. So if you start to give a direct person all this data, they're going to get bored and they're going to get move on and they're not going to give you what you need. You're not giving them the information they need. So they're not going to be able to give you the decision that you're looking for. At the same time, a conscientious person that needs data, if you go at them like a direct person, give them short bullet points to the point so that they can actually, you expect them to make a decision, they're not going to think you understand the situation completely and therefore they're not going to make a decision because they need even more information. So that's why it's important to ask questions, observe how they're answering those questions so you can determine where they fall into that spectrum of the DISC methodology. Once we understand their information needs, we can gather their specific requirement based on what they're looking for. Gather their information so that they can provide them with the information they're looking for so they can actually make the decision that you're looking. So we're going to align with those needs. What do I mean by alignment? If we go to a direct person and we know they need short, sweet bullets to make a decision, we want to provide them that information so they can make that decision. If we're going to go with a influential person, we're going to need, we need to provide them not only the task, but the reasons why that task must happen and the people that are going to be affected by that task. So we want to make sure we understand that. And that's what we're going to do is align with those information needs and make sure that they get what they're getting. We're going to confirm those needs by, again, asking questions. Do you have what you need? Do you need more? And as you work with somebody more and more, you're going to understand them better. You won't have to do so much confirmation. You'll work through that. But that's what you want to do. Ask questions, get more information and continue to build that relationship. And all this while you're building trust and credibility because you're giving them the information they need to make decisions. And then we ensure that they're receiving that value that they're looking for, the information that they need, and then they're making those decisions. And if you're giving them the value they're looking for, they're also going to believe what you're saying and the things you're looking for is valuable and provide you more of what you're looking for. All the while we're aligning with those needs, making sure that we understand what they need and just continue to move down that, build that relationships. All this time, you're trying to figure out what is exactly needed for the stakeholders within your supply chain so that they can buy in to the actual supply chain resilience. So if you're gonna try and convince someone who's a D personality that you need to buy a huge stock of stuff and store it in a warehouse just in case, they're going to want to understand, well, what's the result of that actually happening? If you go to a conscientious person who needs data and ask them to buy a bunch of stuff and store it in the warehouse, they're going to want to know how much, how much does it cost? Why do we need that particular brand over a different brand? What is it going to do in the actual supply chain? What are the chances we're actually going to need it? And they're going to need all that data. And if you don't give them that data, they're not going to approve that decision to store that stuff in the warehouse just in case you need it. Same thing with the steadiness and the influential. All of them have different information needs. And as I mentioned before, if you're interested in learning more about the DISC method of assessing needs and being a more effective communicator, go ahead and click the link below and we'll talk about how you can get involved to understand what your information needs are, as well as what information you need to give to other people involved in that behavior, specific behavior styles that we've been talking about up to this point. Now we're going to transition into taking these leadership styles into actually building resilient supply chains and operating an emergency operations center. What are some of the things you need to do to build an emergency operations center? And then how do you actually run one? And as we mentioned before, these are the five phases of resilient supply chain. And we're actually getting into 
phase four and phase five, we're actually executing Brazilian supply chain. And this is what Captain Howard's getting ready to talk about is Emergency Operations Center. He's going to talk more about how to set one up. Why is it important to have one? All the different pieces that are required to be put together to have an effective one. And then ultimately, how do you run one when actually get into operations to run a, a resilient supply chain? So, Captain Howard, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it away? Thanks, Dr. Randy. Ooh, that's a lot on that screen there. Well, we'll make it simple and to the point for everyone. So one, one of the things I wanted to hit for me is, you know, as an Army officer, as you notice, I said battalion and brigade staff officers. Well, that, that's kind of how, as a, a, a headquarters unit, that's how we're set up to operate. Um, and since I've been officer in charge for multiple military staff sections, I think it's appropriate for me to go over how military staffs are organized and operated to optimize information management. This is just like how you know an emergency operations center or EOC would be set up. Um, and the military definitely has figured that out and figured out ways to have where information's coming in quickly, digested, and sent out in order to make quick decisions. So let's talk about military staff. What is a military staff? Wikipedia defines a military staff as a group of officers, enlisted, and civilian personnel that are responsible for the administrative, operational, and logistical needs of its unit. So there's a basically a bunch of people um, that are together, and they're basically like analysts, and they, they get information from the battlefield, they analyze it for the commander, and they transform information and data for the commander to make informed decisions. So military staffs provide violent directional flow of information, or other words, up and down the chain of command between a commanding officer and a commander's military units. Each commander has a dedicated group of analysts or staff, as we keep saying, that receives and examines data from the battlefield. Operating together, each section provides recommendations and facts to the commander so that the commander can make calculated decisions quickly. So you can basically think this as a commander's information center. One of the key functions of a military staff is to provide accurate and timely information to that commander. The goal of a military staff is basically to process information into useful data that will help with making well-informed decisions. So if you think about it, that is similar to the structure of civilian companies. So you can relate on how it's structured. Like Dr. Randy was saying, this is equivalent to CEO and his or her corporate staff or a site director or a site manager and all of his or her directors in marketing, in operations, in human resources, supply chain, et cetera, that report directly to that site director. So in, a, in addition to producing information, the staff also manages the flow of communication within the unit and around it. If the information is not pertinent to the unit, it is directed to the command level, which can best use that information. Staffs are generally the first to know of issues that affect this group. So staffs are generally the first to know of issues that affect its group. So issues that require major decisions affecting the unit's operational capability are filtered and then communi communicated to the commanding officer. Civilian companies also follow this layout. Any manager, for example, has supervisors from direct the civilian companies also follow this layout. Any manager, for example, has supervisors from different departments that report directly to him. The, supervisor, the supervisors handle their specific operations, but also feed the manager information and recommendations to make higher level decisions. This is the same basic stru structure. This is the same basic structure of military staffs. So basically you have a group of people, you know, the commander is there, as you can see here. So I'll explain a little bit more on this. So you got the battalion commander, you have different ranks uh, you know in this example battalion commander has different specialties or analysts that are responsible for feeding him certain types of information you know I'm about, and i'll go into and explain what each one is but this can be the same way for you as you structure 
your, you know, it, it's the same as if you structure your response center, your EOC, you make sure that you have people that are in the right positions and also have it to where your information is flowing efficiently so that you can make informed decisions. So, but as things also become hectic during a crisis, there'll be large information coming at you and having identified and structured processes for information and communication will allow you to get pertinent information sooner, making the organization more agile and able to take action sooner. So, you know, basically when you're in a hectic situation or even in, in normal operation, you got a lot of data coming at you. You know, you got things happening here, things happening over there, and it's the responsibility of the staff or whoever you put in charge and the structure that you put in place to filter out a lot of, a lot of that white noise, essentially, that's coming at you in order to make informed decisions. And the more that you can plan now and structure and organize while you're planning will allow you to, you know, make more informed and quicker decisions because you're not too busy going around trying to figure out what is pertinent and what is it. When you, especially during a crisis situation, you won't have the time to be figuring all that out. The time to do it is before the crisis. So in the military and other types of incidents, response command centers, the ability to carefully craft any useful situation and utilize the information is the key to success, if you really think about it. So now that you know what a military staff is and its basic form, let's go more into det detail about how, now that you know what a military staff is, let's discuss more in detail about how a military staff is designed and how it's relevant to the supply leader in the civilian sector. In each commander staff, there are groups or staff sections, as they are called, which each have an operational specialty that they are responsible for, such as operations, personal management, and logistics, to name a few. These sections each have a bit piece of a larger puzzle that paints the overall big picture for the commanding officer of each unit, which is the staff. This basic format can be used by you as a supply leader while creating a resilience plan or even during a crisis to maximize and organize information flow within your organization and supply chain. You know, if you think about in supply chain, we pay a lot of attention to the flow of tangible products. In supply chain, if you think about it, we pay a lot of attention to the flow of tangible products through the supply chain. But very few take it a step further and consider how information and communication is flowed through. This is just as important as the product. Without proper data management, the supply chain cannot utilize its full potential, especially during crisis events. As picture on this slide shows, each staff section is organized in this basic format through all levels in the military. When you start going up the chain of command to general officers, you know, to division levels and upwards, and more complicated high-level operations, more staff sections and positions are added naturally, but the basic layout is always followed. Each individual section is managed by an officer, while the entire staff as a whole is run by the exec executive officer, or an EXO as we call it in the military, who is also the second in, in charge in the absence of the commander, because he's already running the staff, he's vetting information as it's coming in, coming in making one big picture for the commander and then presenting it to the commander. So who better to be second in charge? The way it works is each section is assigned a number that ties to their specific functional responsibility. For example, all military staff operation sections will have a three designation. For lower commands in the chain of command, they will be called S3. In a general staff, they'll be called G3. But regardless of what level the staff is, if you noticed, operations sections will always end with a three to represent operations. That's why you hear S1, S2, S3, S4, and so forth. And I'll explain what each section does later on in this presentation. Each of these staff sections consists of pieces a supply leader needs to address and track while planning and executing resilience plan. Consider how a crisis will impact your organization's supply chains personnel, logistics, operations, and technology. This is very important. So let's break down the key sections that compose of a military staff section so you can get a better understanding. First section is known as the S1 section. 
The S1 section is the personnel section, or basically the HR department, as we know in the civilian world. The S1 section coordinates all aspects of personnel services, finance, and record records management. The S1 section coordinates all aspects of personnel services, finance, and records management. The S1 is concerned with everything about overall readiness. Just like in a civilian company, probably in yours, properly managing employee staffing has direct correlation to a company's efficiency and flexibility. This is even more important when in a crisis situation. As we've seen with current COVID-19 crisis, as we have seen with the current COVID-19 crisis, companies were forced to develop alternate work schedules or have employees work from home in order to minimize their footprint and prevent the spreading of the virus, which has major impacts to all facets of normal operating business. When developing a resiliency plan, consider what the impacts of the situation will be to your own company's workforce and to also to all companies in your entire supply chain so that you can create backup plans that are actually realistic and set expectations that are also realistic. Next is the S2. The S2 is responsible for intelligence and physical security. The main purpose of the S2 section is to determine and forecast potential enemy action with past and current information. Just like in the first phase of the resiliency plan, the S2 uses all available data and information to forecast future outcomes. In business, using all the information as available in business, using all the information that's available to you in order to assist in making an educated prediction on the cause and effects of a crisis event is very similar to what an S2 section would do in a combat situation. So the next two positions, I personally have been the officer in charge or OIC. Like I said earlier, I was once a battalion S3 and I've been both battalion and brigade S4s. So starting with the S3, as I said in the past, is the heartbeat of the staff and deals with unit operations. Similar to an operations department at a civilian organization, the S3 section is responsible for coordinating current operations and planning for future operations. In a civilian company, operations departments make sure that customer orders are filled on schedule. This responsibility covers managing product rhythms and also syncing timelines with availability and delivery. Not that much different from the S3 department, don't you say? And then there's the S4, which is the logistics officer, like all the supply leaders, who are responsible for the logistical requirements of the unit. The S4 tracks equipment status, water, food, and fuel status, along with coordinating units to procure any additional supplies that are needed in, in the future. This staff also forecasts logistical requirements for upcoming missions. Sound familiar? This is like a company supply chain department. Next slide, so can you go to the picture? You go to the picture. So as you can see here, here's me, my last position, Brigade S4, where I was briefing to the brigade commander. We have all different, we had the S3 in the far right, uh, another transportation officer, and then the S1 to the right of me, if you're looking at the picture, or the left of me, <laughs> military left, as you can see. And we're all briefing to the brigade commander all the key information that we receive. So the S1 throughout the day receives information about personnel. I receive all the information about logistics. The S3 receives all the information about operations. We sift through that information, figure out, figure out what is pertinent to the mission, what the commanding officer would need to know, and then present that information in big picture so that he can make, like I said in the past, calculated and informed decisions, which is just like how an EOC would work for us. If you have all the key personnel put into place and they have their lanes, which they're responsible for, they know what to do. They have, you know, all their SOPs in place and they're able to kick back information as quickly as possible. And last but not least is the S6, which is the signal section and comparable to an IT department. In the military, communication is arguably the most important component. And having constant and multiple forms of communication is essential to operating cohesively, which is also important in our supply chains. There needs to be total supply chain integration through communication channels. 
So now that you have gone over the basic structure of your military staff section, let's go over how staff sections individually operate while contributing to the overall big picture for the commander. Hey, Howard, I want to add a few a few words here about setting this up. Okay, sir. And that, you know, when we talk about these different staff sections from an EOC point of view, and that, you know, the procurement in, in, in the military, they're focused on the enemy and destroying the enemy. So they got a lot of stuff going on. In business, it's all about resources and meeting the needs of the commander. So you want to translate these things, which Howard did a great job explaining this as we went through, but why is it important? Like an S1 is not only human personnel you have available in your company to do things, but also think about your vendors and their capabilities at this time. So you might have someone, instead of calling them a personnel person, call them a vendor relationship management or vendor management might fit in this category. When it comes to the S2, you need current market intelligence as well as situational intelligence, what's available from your vendors. So you may have a tab in your computer system that's gonna feed you information about what's available in stock, what's in your in inventory, what's going on in the market that way. So that, you know, it's, it sounds, you know, uh, military sexy, like intelligence and that kind of stuff, but really it boils down to what do I have? When do I need it? Where does it need to go? And so you want to appoint somebody in charge of gathering information so you can make decisions. You can't do it all. If you're a procurement director and you're running the EOC or you're that person in charge for that day, you're not going to be able to do all this stuff. And a lot of us today, we end up doing everything from our desk. We're doing all these functions. When you get into an EOC situation, an emergency operations center situation, crisis situation, you need other people focused on one particular task so you can bring it all together and make decisions. Same thing with the S3, you're probably going to be that person running these operations, supporting the bigger picture. And then, you know, you won't look as good as this guy, but, you know, you're going to be doing a good job working for this. And then the S4, that's your transportation side, working with a, a, a 3PL or a 4PL to move stuff. And then thinking about capabilities. Now you're thinking even deeper. How, how are the roads? Are they functional? What kind of trucks and assets are available to run my stuff? And then S6, your computer systems. Are they secure? Can you access them? Can your vendors access them? Can they? Com are they compatible with your different systems that are out there? So I just wanted to you know just take a moment, kind of explain that you know it may appear that well I don't need this I don't need an S3 I don't need an S1 that's not my my job is you need to step back and kind of think well if I have to make decisions quickly, fast, what information do I need at my fingertips so that I can make a decision? And now what Howard's getting ready to talk about is how do I get to the point that I can make quick decisions with information. So go ahead, Howard, go ahead. And, sorry to interrupt there. I just want to make sure we made those points. That's a good point. Good point. Uh, so the two tools and techniques that military staffs use to help while operating in volatile and high pressure situations, which you may run into, are standard operating procedures or SOPs, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, and battle drills. Both SOPs and battle drills are pre-planned processes or actions that need to be taken for predetermined situations. So the first tool is SOPs, which are both used by civilian and military organizations. SOPs are set up or sets. SOPs are sets of step-by-step -step instructions compiled by both military and civilian organizations to help personnel carry out complex and routine operations. SOPs aim to achieve efficiency, quality output, and uniformity of performance while reducing miscommunication. So the key takeaway here, if you think about it, is step-by-step. -step. SOPs provide clear-cut directions and instructions as to how teams and members within an organization must go about completing certain processes. So through SOPs are much more complicated than a simple document with procedures on it. SOPs are meant to provide an on the ground explanation of what needs to happen and to ensure a given process goes as planned. For an organization, to run like a finely tuned machine, team members need to be on the same page at all times. That's both literally and figuratively. In each staff section, they have their own SOPs that are unique to their specific roles and are a key contributor to staff sections processing information and acting quickly. Employees and military pers personnel who have well-defined SOPs 
You don't have to think twice or think about what the next best course of action is. So right in, in your company, when you have an SOP, you have different things that you need to hit, right? So, sir, do you have any SOPs that you know of? We have the SOP, like the uh, uh, urgent request SOP would be, what is the process? If, you know, you have a crisis situation and you need resources right away, you know, who do I call? How do I contact them via email, via phone, via radio? So all that needs to be defined as, a, you know, just kind of as a simple SOP that most organizations should have is how do I request stuff? And then how do I know that my request has been received and is being acted on? So you need to know who your points of contact are, what forms need to be filled out so you can define the requirement or explain what your requirement is. What elements of a requirement do I need in order to resource that particular requirement? So having that all laid out step by step and, you know, we've talked about the rapid response planning process, rapid supply chain planning. SOPs are key in developing them and rehearsing them so that when you need to make decisions quickly, as Howard said, you know exactly what to do, what the elements are, and everyone understands. One of the quickest ways to show slow things down is have one person not understand what the SOP is, and they just start throwing a wrench into the whole system, and everyone gets bogged down because something's out of out of order, not operating the way it should be. Okay, so you know a very simple SOP request, urgent request. I need it now. What do I have to do? First is the normal routine routine request. Something that I don't need now, but I'm going to need eventually is an urgent versus an urgent request, which I need right now, yesterday, get it quick. There's a different process for both because it's going to require a different priority where you're going to take things from one place and move it over to another place. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Awesome, sir. So the next tool is battle drills. That one I'm sure a lot of people haven't heard of. So having documented SOPs does ensure everything will run smoothly as we both keep saying, but then they also must be practiced and rehearsed. Can't say that enough. Battle drills take SOPs one step further. Battle drills are also sequential actions, but, but then these are trained responses to enemy actions or leaders' orders and ensure that there's understanding by each individual and the leader of that section. And they do this by going through plan step by step as a group. As you notice, as we did in uh, phase four and phase three of our uh, resiliency planning. So I remember in my brigade staff section, we had battle drills for a plethora of situations, such as scenarios for a large number of human casualties, a convoy maybe being attacked or a unit needing an emergency resupply of water and food, just to name a few. So you can see the importance of having those SOPs and battle drills together, right? When someone's being, you know, when you're having a, a large amount of human casualties or there's currently in a convoy being attacked, all these dif different sections are working on their concern area, but then they're also processing information and they know what they're looking for. They know what they need to do, what steps they need to take in order to act quickly. Just like in your EOC, if you already have these determined SOPs, if you go down to battle drills, you know, what, when you have a situation comes, You'll be able to react quickly. The information, the data, you have the process in place that the data is flowing through correctly and quickly and everybody's trained. And it just makes for a lot better for you as a supply leader to make more informed and calculated decisions. Or if you need to pass that information up the chain of command to your commander or to your manager, you have the information that you need and everybody will know what to expect. So we also identified what specific details were needed, also known as critical information inputs, as I was as I was saying, and what information was required, also known as critical information output. Identifying and prioritizing what data is important and what the expected outcome of what that information is, is critical not only for a staff in a combat situation, but for a supply chain leader who's leading in a time of crisis, like yourself may you find yourself. For example, one of our battle drills was based on a situation where a convoy out on mission was hit with an improvised explosive device or an IED. The battle drill had actions for each section, staff section to take immediately. Then at each staff section, they would refer to their SOPs to complete those actions. The S so let's think about this. The S3, what would they need? In operations, they would receive that call that a convoy was attacked 
and distribute relevant information to the relevant stack, staff sections while organizing a response. So the S1 or the personnel section would analyze what was the impact to soldier count and identify how many, if any, soldiers were killed in action. The S2 or intelligence officer would analyze the situation and refer to previous enemy actions or historical data to predict the next action that the enemy would take, possibly a, a potential second attack. And then myself as the S4 logistics officer would be concerned with the status of the vehicles and equipment, and if any vehicles or equipment received damage. The S6 would then also be responsible concerned with establishing or maintaining communications. The data concerning that event would be received by the staff sections, processed into data, and all important information will be filtered out and presented to the commander. All of this at the same time and automatically and without any second thought. You know, especially when you're in an austere environment or in a, you know, in a battle situation or war situation, you know, the number of lives lost or winning that battle will be decided about how people react without having this have any second thought. And and though the impact may not be as high, you know, as when you're in a civilian operation or an EOC, you definitely having those processes, you know, knowing what you need to get out of the information will be critical for you in making sure that, you know, you get your company back on place or having the flexibility in a supply chain to react to a situation. If you think about it, you know, we have limited supply, you know, everybody's, and especially in a crisis situation, as we see with COVID-19, everybody's fighting for resources. Well, if you already have your plans in place, already expecting it, you know what you need to do, you can react quickly and go get the resources that you need before somebody else does. By having clear designated actions, the staff sections can have standardized actions with minimal leader direction. When there's an emergency, Having these planned actions to take will provide smooth transitions from one activity to another and maximize flexibility. Just like in business, being the first and quickest to react may be the difference between mission success or mission failure. So as you can see here in this picture, there's different staff sections here. This is probably more at the vision level. Each staff section, each officer in charge of that section as I was, would go up there and brief. That's kind of like a tabletop, or as we call sand table. They have all the key terrain features where each unit is, and each commander and staff section goes up and explains what their next step is. They go over the battle drill. They go over, you know, if a, say an enemy, enemy helicopter attacks, or if one of our helicopters are shot down, what are the actions that we need to take? And the, sign, the head or the commander of that rehearsal and battle drill can ask questions and make sure that each commander and each staff knows what they're doing. And having this level of thoroughness is important, especially during a crisis situation, so that you know what everybody's doing and what we call back brief. And we're making sure we're asking questions, and the people who are briefing, the commander is asking them questions, making sure that they understand what they're doing. And then also if there's any kind of confusion or they need any kind of answers, the staff is there to ask the commander and ask for guidance so that they can go back, adjust their plans if they need to, and then readdress it with the commander, make sure that it fits what we call commander's intent. There you go, sir. No, it's, it's really important that you know, next slide and then it's again. <laughs> What's that? No, I was gonna say now it's you, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> well yeah you know, it's no, no, yeah. That, that was Howard it. mentioned several things. One I wanted to make, the one point I wanted to make is that when these staff sections are executing, they're all executing simultaneously. Everyone's doing their job at the same time. So instead of one, two, three, four, five in steps, all act at one time because they know exactly what to do. It's how as Howard mentioned, rehearsal is key. During a back brief like this, what you find out is that. They don't see the elephant the way you do. I mean, you may have heard the story about the three blind guys who were, you know, touching an elephant and were asked to explain it. And they explained how, you know, the side of the body felt and how the ear felt and how the trunk felt, how they all felt different. And so their vision of what an elephant actually was, was their piece of the elephant, not necessarily the entire elephant. And that's what we're doing here. We do a back brief like this is we're making sure everyone understands. Now, how does this apply to business? 
is that you know you might assume that certain vendors are available so you need to validate that assumption by calling those vendors to make sure they're still in business you may assume that there's trucks available to move your stuff or that there's a road that's open and you need to validate that and make sure it's working something to consider now is that you know yes the trucks are running but maybe the road is closed because some state has decided not to allow certain things to happen now many of us may start to feel that well the economy's starting to recover and we don't need to worry about this stuff but if you've watched the news lately all of a sudden now the food chains in play and so you would need to look at you know your entire supply chain to say well how is this how does food affect my supply chain you may you know affect your people their ability to come to work and do what you expect them to do so you want to you know start to think about this entire process that we've talked about over the last hour to make sure that you understand how this works together within your organization all the different pieces so when the crisis does happen you have already thought about it so you're able to respond faster and based on what i'm seeing in the news and what's going on in the world you gotta have this stuff ready to go because the next conflict is not going to be one with beans and bullets that i was you know i was talking earlier with some folks about as well it's going to be about the supply chain the economic warfare supply chain warfare that's out there and you as a supply leader are a key person in that process to make sure your business survives if not, someone else is going to take over that business and you're going to be looking for a new opportunity or a new job or just trying to survive yourself. So you won't want to do that. You want to be better, better able to respond and able to be successful in any situation. And it just requires us thinking not to take all this stuff for granted. Think hard. Think differently. OK, so, okay. you know, yeah. go ahead. Howard. OK, and if you think about it, it hold on, let me go back. So as you look at this and you see that e there's these different staff sections, everything's really organized. You have SOPs, you have battle drills, you have all these plans. The one thing I do also want to hit is that sometimes plans don't go as they're planned out or as they're expected. That's why these staff sections, if you notice what I was saying, is they're feeding the commander information, feeding the manager information. And even though you have these places in place, these plans in place, having all this information coming to you you're able to make it to be flexible and make adjustments as required you have the framework and your basic plan but you also need to also be flexible just like in your supply chain it needs to be flexible you know if there's a crisis that hits you know does your whole supply chain know your plan is it going to be is, has it been practiced has it been rehearsed are you guys able to to change direction and continue operations continue with business like Dr. Randy said in the past, you know, are you able to to transfer over and sell the government something, or are you able to use another road? You know, all of this takes into account, and just not just having structure, but also having the flexibility to react to any certain situation. So yeah, as we've been mentioning, you know, it's all about planning, thinking, getting ready for that, and as we talk about our supply chain resilience program coming up. Tabletop exercise is going to be a key piece to this. The entire program is going to be deal, dealing with training. How do you do this stuff? Building, building your own supply chain resilience plan, building your own SOPs. We're going to coach you through building your own. And then ultimately, you're going to get, be put through tabletop exercises in many different situations. So you can actually execute your plan and see if it's going to work. And then you'll be evaluated and given key information so that you can improve your plan. And if you think about, you know, well, how much is all this worth? What I can offer you is how much is it worth if you don't do this? What's it going to cost you? So start to think about those things. And as I mentioned before, we're going to be launching our supply chain resilience program here in the near future. So make sure that you're on our list, which I'll give you here in a few slides. But before I tell you how to get involved in that program, I want to make sure you have these resources. Make sure you go ahead and get the mind maps so you can get these mind maps and have these at your fingertips. Also, send me an email at randy at cpsmtraining.com so that we can send you this book and you can see how the Marine Corps did it way back when in Operation Iraqi Freedom. And make sure you don't miss Howard's brand new ebook that's out there where he's going to give you key insights to building your own resilient supply chain based on his experience as a military supply chain manager, a logistics officer, someone who's built this stuff and make, actually used it during operations such as wildfires and other things in the state of California, and it actually worked because they did the planning, they did the work. So now we want you to go right here, cpsmtraining.com, 
supply chain resiliency course early access go there right now put your name in this so when we launch it you're going to get early notifications so that you can jump in on this program and start to build your resilient supply chain whether it's for your company or just for your future career you want to be on this list to learn more about this program so you can implement these concepts with your current opportunity or be able to articulate your ability to do these things with your next opportunity. Howard, do you have anything else to offer before we wrap up for tonight? Hey guys, you know, before we go, it's talking about my EPUB that I just made and, and now it's available for you. I think it's really helpful for all supply chain leaders. It goes, a lot of it goes step by step on how you can analyze your supply chain and make it more resilient and give you a lot of tips and tricks. Like Dr. Randy was saying, I use a lot of it, you know, especially when I was a commander on the ground, actually helping with you know, with the humanitarian efforts with Santa Barbara that got hit by floods and also by fires. So I have real life application to this and it's actually worked. You know, I have a unique experience in both the military and commercial side of supply chain. I've been able to mesh the experience together and make it and present it to you in this book. So hopefully it helps out. And also don't forget to sign up for our resilience program, as Dr. Randy was saying. Looking forward to being able to work with everyone and pass on my knowledge that I've learned, you know, my applicable knowledge that I've got from experience that I've gotten from being a logistics officer and also being supply chain. So I'm really excited about it. I know Dr. Randy is as well. I am. It's, I mean, it's going to be a great program. Not only is it going to be a lot of fun, it's timely, and it's going to build things that you can use right here in the near future. Unfortunately or not, you need to be ready to make sure you can deal with whatever's coming up here in the near future. And then we're going to give you those tools to do that. So with that, have a wonderful evening, have a wonderful day, whenever it is, Jen, you're watching this particular webinar. We look forward to working with you and being able to build your resilient supply chain and have a wonderful time and we'll talk to you soon. Howard, go ahead and sign off.